Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. Today for animal biology, we're going to continue talking about phylogenetic trees, cladograms, and um, kind of the way at which we classify organisms, animals in particular, um, into larger groups. Okay, so we're going to talk about some organization of animals through like tissues. So how many different layers of tissues do organisms have? Uh, what kind of plane are, is the organism divided on? Or can you divide the organisms? Or do they have some kind of symmetry? Um, do they have internal compartments? Uh, these things are kind of the precursors to getting animals into major groups. Okay? And then from once we get into the the, that group, then we can start dividing it into phyla that that you know would ha have species in and families that are that are specific to that phylum. Okay, so first we're going to start talking. We'll come back to this. This is um, whether or not an organism has internal compartments. Okay, and so these are all triploblastic organisms. Okay, meaning that they have three layers of tissue. They have an ectodermis, a mesodermis, and an endodermis. And sometimes those are called different things like gastrodermis, okay, or um, just other names. But ecto, meso, endo um, is pretty common. Okay, now whether or not they have compartments would be whether whether they're coelomate or not. So. An acelomate, A in biology means non or no. So this means they have no column. So they have no internal compartments. Okay, so they're acelomate mates. Pseudocelomates means that they do have compartments, but they're not controlled by the mesoderm. So they're not direct um, connection between the compartment and the um, mesoderm or the mesoderm and endoderm do not have direct connection. So there's no connective tissue. But this is kind of a precursor. So you have none, you have some, but they're not set up the same as true coelomates, where you can see that there's this muscle connection, these connective tissues to create cavities. Okay, and we'll come back and we'll talk about this a lot more in a little bit. So to begin with, we want to talk about symmetry of an organism. Okay, so how is an organism arranged on an axis? Is there a way at which you can divide an organism and get two equal parts? Or is there a way that you can divide an organism and get five equal parts? Or, or something along those lines. Okay? So if you cannot divide an organism, so no matter how you arrange the organism, you cannot divide it in equal portions. Okay. They're called asymmetric or asymmetry. Okay. So there's no central access point. Okay. If the organism can be divided into mirror image, like a left mirror and a right mirror, okay, like ourselves, then that's considered bilateral symmetry. Now that doesn't mean that they have to be divided equally. Like if you divide us in half, it doesn't mean that equal portion of our heart's going to be on the right side and left side, our liver on the right side and left side. It just means externally we can be di divi divided on a longitudinal axis and that will make a right and left mirror image. Okay. And then radial symmetry is kind of unique in the sense that <clears throat> radial symmetry is going to be on a central axis that you can d divide um, and depending on how you can divide the organism so if you can divide them into just two sections that are equal then they're called biradial um, if you can divide them into say something like five sections they're called pentaradial and and so on so the organisms that would make up a group like this would be something like starfish, so echinoderms, um, some cnidarians, and uh, just other groups. And we'll go through this, and, and I'll show you more examples, and I'll show you how 
the organism is divided. Now, bilateral symmetry is for most vertebrates, and even for that matter, a lot of invertebrates. Asymmetry is pretty much the sponges um, or the larval phases of some other organisms. And um, we'll, we'll talk more about symmetry or animal symmetry. It's important to know because it dictates kind of how an organism develops, um, whether they're developing on a longitudinal axis or on a central axis. And so um, that will determine like where the mouth forms, where the anus forms, um, these kind of things. And we'll come back to it. Okay? So here's an example of a sponge. Okay? Um, so this is Demospongia. That's a class that this sponge belongs to. Um, and you can see that there is really no way that you can divide this and get equal portions or a, a right and left mirror or a top bottom mirror. So there's no there's no dividing this on the central axis. There's no dividing this on the long, longitudinal axis or longitudinal axis. Um, there, there's no symmetry here. That doesn't mean that sponges don't have any symmetry at portions of their life. Okay? So a sponge sometimes in the larval form will have symmetry. will have either radial symmetry and there's some uh, unique examples of having bilateral symmetry. And some organisms have both, radial and bilateral symmetry. And we'll talk about those organisms in a little bit also. So here is some cnidarians. Okay, they have, um, they can be di di divided on the central axis, and in some cases they can divide, be divided on a longitudinal axis, giving you both a radial symmetry and a bilateral symmetry. And then, of course, you know, vertebrates, um, they can be divi divided on kind of a transverse or on a median plane, okay, and that'll give you a mirror image of right and left. Now they don't have to be equal, okay, but you know you have a limb on the right and a limb on the left, okay, an ear on the right, ear on the left, eyes on the right, eyes on the left, etc. Okay, now this this kind of drawing, this kind of sketch here with these different um, planes is important for dissecting purposes. So when we do a lot of dissection, you might want to have at least an idea of the different planes because I will talk about it um, in my demos and I will also tell you in, in lecture or in lecture before lab, um, I might say, okay, this organism, you need to make a decision on the ventral side of the median plane. Right? Which would mean that you know, you're cutting on the belly of the organism on the median plane, moving from the anus or the cloaca, depending on the organism, up to the mouth of the organism. Okay? Other organisms, I might tell you, you need to make an incision on the frontal plane okay? and on the anterior side. So if we're going to meet, remove the, the, uh, the skull of the organism to look at the brain, okay? I'll say make a frontal plane incision. So you're just going to kind of shave down. Um, on a frontal plane, okay, on the anterior side of the organism, so you can look at the brain. Okay, so knowing what plane you're on, what you know, what's dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior, is important um, for dissecting purposes, and it's also important for scientifically writing up what you've done um, through dissection. So keep that in mind as you progress. Okay. So, one of the key things that we can use to separate different groups of animals has to do with the organization of tissues or whether or not they have tissues. Okay, so unicellular or cytoplasmic organization okay, means that there are no tissues and cells are just either um, forming colonies or they go at life on their own. They're either by themselves single-celled organisms like most of Protista, okay, or 
that you can get aggregations of cells that occur within um, kind of a cytoplasmic organism. Okay? But they're not tissues. So even though you might have different types of cells, and they even might be arranged in which they can communicate with each other, um, because they're not attached to each other, they're not distinct enough, um, they're, they're not tissues. Okay? So sponges, so we'll talk about protista. The protists are what gave rise to animals. Okay? They also gave rise to plants. And one line of protista gave rise to plants. One line gave rise to animals and fungi. And we'll talk about protista. We'll talk about the protozoans. Um, they're, for the most part, single-celled organisms. Sponges, on the other hand, have multiple cells. They're multicellular, but they have no tissues. Okay? And so we'll talk about periphera in a little bit also. The next level of organization is going from no tissue to diploblastic organization, meaning you have two tissue layers. Okay? So you have an ectodermis, okay, which occurs on the outside. You have an endodermis, which occurs on the inside. And then you have a mesoglia, or you know sometimes they're called different, but mesoglia is non-cellular is not a tissue. Now there could be and there are situations where the, where the mesoglia does have cells embedded in it. But often those cells either came from the ectodermis or the endodermis. So they're not specific to that region. So they're not actual mesoderm cells. They're mesoglia with some ectodermis cells in it. That's diploblastic organization. So we go from not having any tissue to having two tissues. Currently, there are no examples of an organism that has just an ectodermis or just an endodermis. So we don't have any monoblastic organization. Right? Now, does that mean that we jumped from not having any to straight to two? Probably not. Um, it means that having a single tissue layer has probably been outcompeted, evolutionarily speaking, by having two tissue layers, and so those organisms are now extinct. Okay. Um, that, or we haven't found a monoblastic organization. All right, so triploblastic is the one that most people are, are most commonly um, associated with and understand the best. Um, and that would be that you have three layers of tissue. You have a mesoderm, okay, which is sandwiched in between the ectodermis and the endodermis. Okay? And that mesoderm is um, you know, extremely important uh, for complexity of life. It allows for support. It allows for muscle contraction. It allows for, so this is where muscles are going to be built. This is where connective tissue is going to be. Um, it's going to, you know, allow for uh, veins, and it's going to allow for capillary action. It's going to allow for the flow of uh, nutrients and blood and and whatnot. That's all part of the mesoderm. Um, and you'll see that as we advance and get more complex in an organism, the mesoderm starts to take a bigger and bigger role in. Um, that organism's organization. <clears throat> now, when we look at triploblastic organization, okay, that organism can also have cavities, so open spaces or at least enclosed regions where different functions can occur. Maybe reproduction occurs in this region, maybe respiration occurs in this region, maybe digestion occurs in this region. And that would be body cavities would be present in that organism. Okay? And so there's lots of ways at which these cavities can advance um, the functionality of an organism. Okay? So it's giving it a distinct advantage in many situations. Okay? If you have organs, then now you have these specific regions at which you can carry out filtration, reproduction, respiration, digestion, 
um, you know, that's great. You don't have any mixing of things. If you don't have this, then a lot of times you'll mix. So, like, maybe you're taking in oxygenated or taking in oxygen, but it's mixing with carbon dioxide. So the efficiency of your respiration is not good. Okay? Other times, maybe you're taking in food, and it's mixing with things that has already been digested and is waste. And so you're not very efficient. So when you uh, defecate or remove the waste, the food goes with it. Okay? And we'll talk about organisms that just have open cavities in which everything mixes together and um, they're not very efficient. And if your efficiency is pretty low, then typically the size of the organism is pretty small. Right? So it doesn't facilitate a large body size if, if you're not very efficient with burning energy. Okay. Lots of other things. We'll talk about hydrostatic skeletons. We'll talk about all these things um, as we progress. Okay. So again, I kind of hit on this earlier on. So there are three main types of compartments or organisms that have a compartment or don't have a compartment. You have triple blastic acelomates. Okay, it means that the mesoderm, the connective tissues, the muscle, the contractile tissue, all that, it just forms a solid mass. Okay? There's no open spaces for no organ, there's no organ development, there's no compartmentalizing your digestive from your reproduction, etc. Um, it's just one mass. Now, you have control. These organisms do have control over the mesoderm. They can flex. They can help with digestion. They can move um, and uh, control the ectodermis and the endodermis using the mesoderm. But, uh, you know, as far as compartments go, there are none. Triploblastic pseudocelomates, okay, this would mean that you have a pseudo column or a pseudo, pseudo sac, pseudo compartment, uh, which would allow you to indeed separate things out, but there's no connective tissue. There's no um, way to associate that with, say, the endoderm. So it's associated with the ectoderm. Um, it does allow for a compartment to form, okay, but they're not quite colomates. They're not quite there in the form of having control, shutting off areas, things like that. And we'll, we'll talk about these guys, obviously. Triple blastic coelomates. Eh, body cavity is completely surrounded by the mesoderm, so you have con complete muscle control over that region and connective tissue. So by having that, that means that you can close off that compartment Okay. You can open that compartment up so you can release sperm or egg or, or digest without mixing of different um, substances. So you're not missing, mixing your material that you're digesting with the material that you're reproducing. Okay. Um, and that really allows for you know, the precursors to organ development and, and all these other things, um, cardiovascular systems, respiratory systems, digestive systems, reproductive systems to form. Um, and so we are triple blastic coelomates. Uh, humans are, but there are lots of examples of organisms that are, um, you know, fall in one of the other columns or one of the other places along the triple blastic formation. <clears throat> All right, so when we look at taxonomy, again, like I said before, the goal of a taxonomic grouping is to make that group a monophyletic group. Make that group have a single ancestral species. Okay? So the kingdom Animalia is monophyletic. Okay? It's connected to a single species of protozoan. Okay? Through molecular evidence, through embryological evidence, it connects back to protozoans. Now within the animal kingdom though, 
there are situations where we're not monophyletic. Right? So there are four phyla that originated independently of one another. Right? And we'll talk about these. We'll talk about periphera. We'll talk about cnidarians. Okay? And we'll talk about these situations where you know, they're very similar to each other, but they don't share a common ancestor. Now, they probably do share a common ancestor. We just haven't found it yet. So again, like I, I, I can't talk about this enough and, and drive this home enough. Just because currently that group is considered polyphyletic, meaning it has multiple ancestors does not mean it's actually polyphyletic. Okay? The likelihood that it's polyphyletic is very, very low. The actual likelihood that we just have not discovered the ancestor that makes it monophyletic is much higher. Um, otherwise, you have multiple events of convergent evolution, and we have just lumped them together <clears throat> into the same group, and uh, they don't belong in the same group. Okay? That's another quite possibility, is that we lump them, and they actually don't belong together. Okay? And you'll see that in some situations, that's been the case, or at least in my opinion, that's been the case. All right, so again, we can look at what kind of symmetry do they have. So if they have bilateral symmetry, okay, um, and then we can look at the way at which they develop. Okay, so this is key. We're looking at how you can divide the organism, okay, and then how does the blastula form. So after the sperm and egg come together, forming a zygote, okay, when the zygote is growing and, and uh, increasing in cell numbers, how does that blastula form? Is it forming um, uniformly, okay, then we're talking about duodenostomes. Is it forming in kind of a spiral um, formation where maybe the top part is a little bit smaller than the bottom, or the bottom part's a little bit smaller than the top? Okay, and those cells are not uniform. It's not a uniform formation and uniform division. Then we're probably talking about a proteostome. The other thing that proteostomes have that duodenostomes do not, and, um, so there's duodenostomes, uh, is that proteostomes will often have a intermediate, sometimes free swimming, free living larval stage that has a different kind of life cycle than the adult stage, okay, which we call a trochophora larvae. So a proteostome will have this intermediate larval phase. Okay. Proteostomes will also go through echodysis. Okay. And echodysis means that they shed or they molt their external skeleton. Okay. Now, in some cases, that's molting something that is very soft, and so um, it's not... It's not like the exoskeleton that you would think of in insects. Now, insects are part of proteostoma okay, um, and go through echodysis, but not all of echodysis is, is that um, hard cuticle layer that you, you typically think of. Okay? And we'll come back. Um, you know, a lot of these organisms have been lumped into, proteostomes have been lumped into two main groups. Lophotrichozoans or, or echodosins. Okay? And we'll talk about both those main groups. Okay? And then the, the other group, okay, which has radial um, indeterminate cleavage, which means that the cells are, are uniform. Okay? Those are duodenostomes. Okay? And that's the group that we belong to. And we'll talk about our group and all the other organisms that belong with us. Okay? So again, the animal kingdom is a monophyletic group, okay, single ancestor, but within it we can have some very unique situations. We can have things like Mesozoa, 
periphera and nidermians, tenophora, these groups, these this grouping, they all have separate ancestors, okay? but we lump them all together into one group. Um, this is probably a, a problem and, and uh, not a good way to, to approach this group, and it's probably just a result of lack of knowledge. Lophotrichozoan, single ancestor. Echidosa, single ancestor. Duteostoma, two ancestors. Um, so again, lack of knowledge. Um, most likely, we either need another group in between, okay, or um, we need to find the ancestor that would connect these two pieces. Same thing over here. Either we need to find multiple groups, okay, or we have to find the ancestor that connects all four of these together. And I'll talk about more about this because when we talk about protista, I mean, if you look here, there's a whole bunch of com you know ancestral forms of protista. Each one arising in a new group that's that's found today. Um, there's really no connection, no ancestral connection between the groups, and so protista is the same form as periphera, nigeria, and tenophora, etc. All right, so let's look at that duteostrome, proteostome development. So lophotrichozoans, echidosans, they have this proteostome development. They got this spiral cleavage, okay, where you can see here the top uh, portion of the blastula is much smaller than the bottom portion, okay? Now, it doesn't always have to be kind of this formation. It could have... Um, it could be flipped, and and that's it would result in something, you know, very similar. Okay, um, when we when the blastula is forming, okay, and you get a blastopore, okay, that blastopore is going to develop into a mouth. When we're talking about proteostomes, so mouth first. Okay? When we talk about duteostromes, no spiral cleavage. Okay, blastula is forming, blastopore forms, okay, but the blastopore forms into the anus first. Okay, so duteostromes form their anus before they form their mouth. Proteostomes form their mouth before they form their anus. Okay, proteostomes also have this intermediate larvae, trochophore larvae, okay, and then it develop eventually into an adult um, structure, or no adult life uh, cycle. Okay? Duteostromes go straight from cells um, that have you know clearly been fertilized and are developing etc into the adult form. Okay? Again, of course they go through a juvenile phase etc but there's no intermediate stage of development like trochophore larvae. Okay? Alright so with that we will switch gears just a little bit and hit the point of evolution into animals. So we're going to talk about protozoans and the link between protozoans and the animal kingdom. Huh? So next time, protozoans.